This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Welcome, welcome to the latest, the freshest edition of Tiger Stock with Chirko and Company. I am your host, Vito Geronimo Chirko, along to my usual psychic and broadcast partner and fun. That is Doc from Doc and Jock, John Charles Macaroon. John, thanks for, by the way, allowing me to be on Doc and Jock last week before Thanksgiving. I guess I got some rave reviews and better reviews because I was on. Just leave it at that. And how are you doing and how was your Thanksgiving, by the way, to start off too here, John? Yeah, Vito, it was nice to have a couple weeks off, kind of get a chance to reset look around Major League Baseball, read a little bit more, and just kind of take a little bit of a break from podcasting. It was great. The holiday time was fun, spent with family, eating a bunch, having a good old time, and now looking forward to getting back in the swing of things. And obviously, the biggest sports story in these parts was the destruction of Michigan, so that perked me right up, and it's been a great week podcasting, getting back in the swing of things. Now, looking forward to talking to you about baseball, and the Tigers made a move. What do you think of the move that was made signing pitcher Matt Moore? Well, really, he's been stinko the last two years, you could say. He's not going to add a ton. I mean, he's Mike Fires-esque, and I think worse than Mike Fires. But he's a veteran, journeyman type of arm that uh, he pitched in 39 games a season ago, recorded a 6.79 earned run average, a whip that was horrible, 1.66. In 2017 with the Giants, in 32 games with the Giants, uh, a 1.53 whip, a 5.52 ERA, a career earned run average of 4.56. This guy was good at one point with the Tampa Bay Rays, but it was a while back now. I think it was in 2013 when he finished ninth in the Cy Young Award race in the American League, and he did, and he won 17 games during that 2013 campaign. 17-4 and four and 27 games started with the Rays in 2013. Since then, his production has tailed off. In 2015, at a 5.43 earn run average and only 12 games pitched. In 2016, with two clubs with the Rays and the Giants, he recorded a 4.08 ERA. It was the last year in which he was at least decent as his FIP that season was 4.17. And fielding independent pitching is what FIP stands for. I've talked about that stat before. It's kind of this advanced metric used to evaluate arms. So when your FIP is close to your ERA and your ERA is low, well, that means your FIP is good and where it should be and that you're pitching well. And your FIP, just overall-wise, better be 4 or below. Like 4.15 around that, if it is, then you're all right. But you want to have an FIP of 4 or below. And the past two seasons, I'll just say this really quick too, John, before I stop talking about Matt Moore, of all guys. In 2017, at a 4.75 FIP, this past campaign had a 5.25 FIP, meaning he's been kind of stinko, and really not just kind of, he's been stinko the past two, definitely the past two campaigns. Here's the thing. If you're a left-handed arm, you get chances. And even though he struggled a little bit with Texas, his numbers on the road, as opposed to what they were in that uh, hitter-friendly ballpark in Texas, were vastly different. His numbers on the road were pretty decent. He was able to get outs, and uh, it looks like even a guy like you could get a tryout if you were left-handed. You might A lot be... of guys could. You probably couldn't even throw the ball to home plate <laughs> during a ceremonial first pitch before a game. But anyways... But they're giving him a chance, and they're going to be looking to uh, maybe use him as a reliever or maybe a starter here and there, and... Uh, He's flexible, and that's what you look for. A guy that's 29 years old, still throws 93-mile-an-hour fastball, has a curveball and a changeup, and he's more regarded as a fly ball pitcher, which also suits the ballpark in which he'll pitch in at home here in Detroit at Comerica Park. So they're going to be looking for him to do a little bit better. And Vito, unfortunately, that's just the level of talent we're going to get right now, especially with the Tigers trying to bring down their payroll. They're just trying to get guys to contribute and not pay him as much. So a guy, a journeyman, basically, and that's what they're kind of looking for. And it sucks to say it, that they have to kind of go out and survey the landscape and bring in guys that are journeymen and hope that they kind of, you know, catch lightning in a bottle. But that's just the way they are right now, and that's just the way it is. The Tigers are looking for guys on the cheap to do the job. And so sometimes you're probably going to see situations in which Moore gives up some runs. But if he can, you know, maybe reclaim a little bit of magic, Comerica Park can make 
an average pitcher will look really astounding. 93 mile an hour fastball, fly ball pitcher. Maybe he can do some things. What do you project for him to do, and what type of success can he have with the Tigers? Well, really quick, welcome to Motown, Matty Mo. Matty Mo is his nickname. What kind of nickname is that? <laughs> Matty Mo, M O E, they say on his baseball reference page. Now, what I expect out of him in 2019 is like a four and a half ERA at best. I mean, I don't expect anything better than a four and a half ERA from a guy that recorded a negative 1.2 wins above replacement mark in 2018. Meaning he was below average, a below average pitcher, only started in 12 games as well a season ago. As I said earlier, he did appear in 39 games, but only a starter in 12 of those games. And he wasn't a very good starting pitcher, wasn't a very good pitcher at all in 2018. When your war is below zero in the negatives, it means you were horrible and below replacement level. That means there's guys in the minors that were better than that more. In 2018. So that's the kind of pitcher the Tigers are stuck with and that they're getting in Matt Moore. Okay, so you're thinking middle of the road may be a guy that you could flip, but he's probably going to be around and maybe can uh, contribute in a way that can elevate that bullpen. But in the end, you look at it, it's not a drastic move in your mind. Well, no, he's not a drastic upgrade. I don't think he's even Mike Fires esque I don't think he's even of that caliber, which is sad to say the Tigers are resorting to guys like this right now. These are the Tigers' sexy free agent pickups for the time being. They're not going to do anything better than getting a guy such as Matt Moore. Okay, now I want to talk to you about the payroll because it's been talked about the Tigers are losing approximately $80 million in salary off of the books in 2019 as opposed to what they paid out this year in 2018. And you look at it and you go, wow, $55 million or so is allocated to Jordan Zimmerman and Miguel Cabrera. So the rest of the salary basically is going to be about $90 million and it's going to be tied up for the rest of the players. But two guys take up $55 million. It's interesting. A lot of guys are still getting checks that are no longer here. Guys like Prince Fielder, guys like Justin Verlander are still getting checks and uh, getting paid with the (laughs) signature of the Illich Corporation. But... How are you feeling about the Tigers, their payroll situation? Being around $130 million, even though they're probably going to finish nowhere near the top of the division. It's, it's lower, but do you think it's going to be prohibitive in terms of maybe you know not allowing the Tigers to make moves if there's somebody available that they really want? Do you think the salary, the payroll is an issue, or do you say, you know what, they have a number, they're going to stick with it, and just they're not going to go after the big names? Because for whatever reason, you know, you read around the internet, you troll around Twitter, for whatever reason, national media is somehow pinpointing Bryce Harper coming to the Tigers. It was really weird. It was kind of hopeful, but... Who said that, by the way? Oh, some national media. I'll look around. A blogger? A real? No. Credible uh, writer and journalist? Uh, I think it was Sports Illustrated, but I'll look around. Okay. Yeah, look around. Tell me. Please tell me the source for that info. Yeah, and it's something where you go, man, you know, if you're Bryce Harper, how do you turn down $300 million guaranteed in, in, in the hopes of getting more? But I just don't see the Tigers making a huge splash in terms of going out and spending, you know, opening the checkbooks. Well, the Tigers aren't going to make a big splash like Bryce Harper, so you're really drinking some Kool-Aid and you're on some drugs. Or you should you should get back on your pills if you're thinking that, okay? I'll just say that much regarding the Tigers and any kind of pursuit by the Tigers of Bryce Harper or a Manny Machado caliber player that's going to demand north of 100 mil, north of, who knows, 150 mil. And Bryce Harper, speaking of him specifically, he could demand north of 300 mil in totality over 10 years or more. And he's not worth it. And not worth it for the Tigers specifically. They're going to focus and settle on these lower tier free agent options out there that are cheaper guys that can be bargain guys that are reclamation reclamation projects. They're not going to take on guys that are really proven and that are demanding the big money right now because they're not trying to win in 2019. See, Vito, as I'm approaching 40, I still got it. My mental capacity is there. Not as sharp as I have been in the past. Memory's still a little bit off, but sometimes... It's shoddy here and there, I can tell. Yeah, but Sports Illustrated John Taylor wrote this article, and he laid out the case... Was it speculative, or was it because of something that he knows? Of the Tigers, he wrote, How many Tigers outfielders do you know beyond Nick Castellanos? I'd be a little concerned if you could name more than one. But a trio of Castellanos, top prospect Daz Cameron at some point in 2019, and Harper is a nice step toward contending once again in the Motor City. So he's making a case that the Tigers should go out and pursue Bryce Harper, and that could solidify 
the outfield. So he got me, you know, got me all excited. I'm like, oh, national writer, Sports Illustrated, John Taylor came out and said it. What do you think? Would you invest that much money? Now, here's the problem. Everybody that's looking at Bryce Harper is realizing, okay, he's only had 100 RBIs once, and in recent seasons, he's gotten injured. And something's up with Bryce Harper in that his batting average has significantly declined. He's kind of a, you know, all or nothing kind of guy. And he's somebody that's going to require a long-term commitment at 26. He wants a 10-year deal, upwards of $30 million a year plus for a guy whose skills obviously, you know, don't exactly fit right now with what the Tigers are doing because a guy like that you bring on when you're going to look to win now or next year or the year after. You're not going to get anything out of the Tigers for the next four or five years, maybe. By then, you can't allocate $150 million to this guy, um, even though, you know, as noted here, even though the Tigers' outfield is garbage and nobody knows who's out there. Well, there are things that I like that I would like to get, like Ariana Grande to be my girlfriend or Selena Gomez to be my girlfriend. I would like the Tigers to get a guy like Bryce Harper, but guess what? It's not going to happen. Yep. There's a sexy prize free agent out there, but this is all speculative, and this guy, I think, is trying to start some conversation here for himself, too. Exactly. And his piece. And it ends with Taylor places the Tigers in Tier 7, or, quote-unquote, no chance, Yeah, Tier no 7, how many tiers are there? For signing Harper. Oh, there, how many tiers are there, really? I mean, what tier do you have to go to to We're, get to the point where, well, you have no chance at all? I guess Tier 7 is that, because I would never imagine there being seven tiers, because if you're... Probably in Tier 5 or after Tier, you know, from Tier 4 and on, you're not going to have a chance at getting Bryce Harper. A lot of teams don't have a shot at getting Bryce Harper. I'll just say this really quick. Because they don't have the funds to allocate towards Bryce Harper in the long term. He wants way too much money. A crazy amount of money and too much money for a lot of teams to afford him. Do you see him getting upwards of that Manny Machado number, 10 years, 300, or maybe uh, 325? Do you, you see him getting $32 million a year? What do you think is the proper number for him? And do you think those that are critiquing him and his numbers are accurate in that assessment of a guy like Bryce Harper? Well, Scott Boris is his agent, so you would expect him to get a lot of money on the open market because he's one of the biggest prized free agents out there right now. Him and Manny Machado are the two top-tier free agents in this year's free agent class. So I expect him to get north of 25 mil. I'll just say that. Will he get north of 30? No, I'm not going to go that far. But if we did a game of Big Vito's over-under, a widely popular game worldwide— I would set the over-under at 25.5 mil that he gets per season, and I'm going to say over that amount. I think he gets north of 25.5, and and I think uh, the percentage chance of him getting north of 25.5 mil per season is over 50%. Now, if you give to me 30.5 million per season that I expect him to get, well, I'm going to say the odds of that happening are below 50% on the big veto over-under meter. Now, in talking and revisiting Matt Moore, there were a couple other pitchers that were on the radar that the Tigers could have looked at and maybe still could acquire. Uh, They include Irvin Santana of the Twins, um, Jordan Lyles, formerly of the San Diego Padres, and Marco Estrada, formerly of the Blue Jays. Any of those names ring a bell to you or anybody that you think could have been maybe a better signing had it worked out? Well, Marco Estrada used to be good with the Jays. He's kind of a sexy option, but you're not going to get a great top flight arm to lead your rotation. So Estrada's not that either. And all those guys that you named off, besides for Estrada, or just like Estrada, aren't top-tier starting pitchers either. They're not going to be the ace arm of your starting rotation anytime soon or anytime ever moving forward. So guess what? The Tigers are going to have to settle on these guys that are middling arms, middle-of-the-row guys, if not to the bottom of the row guys, and at the bottom of the totem pole, such as Matt Moore for the time being, because they come cheaper, and the Tigers aren't trying to win, so they're not going to spend big bucks on a Patrick Corbin. Or try to trade for a James Paxton like the Yankees just did to upgrade. And the the rich get richer as the Yankees did, as I discussed with Max Boltman on Tigers Talk last week, which I hoped you tuned into, Doc. I don't know if you did. But anyways, Max and I, we did discuss some Tigers news and notes last week from a coffee shop. And we discussed James Paxton being traded to the Yanks. Well, the Tigers aren't going to make a trade like that for a big top flight arm at this point. They don't maybe have the resources in the farm system, but more importantly, they're not willing to give up those resources in the farm system, those top flight pitching prospects such as Casey Mize and others, Matt Manning. Those guys aren't going to be moved right now by the Tigers to upgrade their big league roster. Thus, the Tigers aren't going to end up with a guy like James Paxton, and then they're not going to allocate the resources necessary to land a Patrick Corbin. So you're not going to get Patrick Corbin. You're not going to get a top flight arm if you're not willing to spend, you know, or willing to pony up in terms of giving up prospects from your farm system that are top flight pitching prospects. So when that's the case, you have to settle for the likes of Matt Moore. Maybe a Marco Estrada is better, but Marco Estrada is not much better himself. 
Well, Vito, we got some news. Uh, a coach, scout that was affiliated with the Tigers, no more. Uh, we got to give him his proper send off. Here it is. Can you guess who's no longer with Tigers? And I know what you're talking about Donnie Baby. Donnie Baseball, Don Kelly. I'm He's sad. leaving. He's Are you leaving. sad? I'm sad. A guy that's just a journeyman that brought a lot to the table. No longer with the organization. You know where he went? Where'd he go? The Houston Astros. To Upgraded win. To coach and win. Donnie Kelly Baseball, no longer. His great stint with the Tigers as a scout. Uh, nobody even talked about it. We don't even know what he really did as a scout with the Tigers. Well, he scouted, but we don't know to what extent and how much he really worked with the Tigers this past season. But I think it was only this past season he spent with the Tigers as a scout. So now he's gone, just like that. And now we're left with no Donnie Kelly Baseball, Doc. Should we cry some more? You already started crying. You have some tears right now in the studio, I see. Piling up for yourself. Maybe I should start crying, or I will uh, tonight after this podcast recording. I'm reading Kelly, 38 years old, is considered a future major league manager. Yeah, who isn't that, you know, <laughs> has played in the majors at one point and has that scouting experience even now? I guess people trust his baseball acumen. You have to trust somebody's baseball acumen, too, to be a scout at v- any level. Vito, I want you to show more respect. Somebody that's well-known in the game has said this about Don Kelly. Quote, he can do whatever he wants in this game, adding that he had given Kelly's name to a pair of general managers last season as a potential managerial candidate. One rival talent evaluator said this about Don Kelly, that he's got, that he, he passed his name along. He was somebody that was like, hey, if you know anybody, and they said Don Kelly, and he's not with he's the Tigers. He's 38 years young, I'll say. 38 Four. years old. Donnie Kelly baseball can do anything. Truly can. He probably could, you know, pick up Ariana Grande and end up with her, end up with Selena Gomez. I don't know about any of that happening, but I love how the guy said he could do anything. Donnie Kelly Baseball, right? The okay. man, the myth, the legend. The legend lives on of Donnie Kelly Baseball moving on to greener pastures with the Houston Astros. Do you see him having success? Because As a big league skipper, it's hard to say, but you see these guys being pulled out of the broadcast booth like Aaron Boone with no coaching experience prior becoming managers and winning 100 games with the Yankees. And was the Yankees with that great roster, that great talent. But still, guys are being picked out of the broadcast booth nowadays to become big league skippers with no prior coaching experience whatsoever. So Donnie Kelly being a scout in the past, now having that little experience as a scout, well, probably would help him out as a big league skipper, but I still like a guy that gets that minor league coaching experience first. Give him the minor league managerial job, then have him work his way up to where he then becomes a big league manager. I would like to see a guy like Donnie Kelly follow that route to become a big league skipper. All right, Vito, time for a quick timeout. Give love to the sponsors, Detroit Sports Commission and Legacy Football Organization. What's coming up in the second half of this podcast? We'll talk about John Paul Morosi. He came out with a list of guys that the Tigers might target at shortstop. And a couple of guys that I discussed last week as well with Max Boltman, those guys will focus on a little bit again. I mean, we've discussed it a little bit before, but we'll focus on it a little bit again in the second half of this week's episode of Tigers Talk. And Doc, as you know, one of our proud sponsors at the DSP Network is Legacy Football, which was founded in 2009, and it emphasizes and focuses on on and off the field development of student athletes and really helps out these kids take the next step in their careers, both on and off the football field. And through the help of Legacy Football, these kids have accumulated offers and gotten the chance to play on national TV such as Fox Sports Detroit at the Legacy Football Senior All-Star Game this past weekend at the Legacy Center Complex in Brighton, Michigan, a great complex for hosting events, and a great event it was this past Sunday over Thanksgiving weekend. And to find out more about Legacy Football and all of the events that they are hosting the rest of this year and into 2019, please contact National Director of Football Operations, Justin Sassante, or go online to Legacy Football's website at www.legacyfootballorg.com.
and uh, to another one of our fine sponsors at the DSP Network now in the Detroit Sports Commission, which has been organizing and hosting marquee events on both the national and international level since 2001. And one of the fine events that they do host on a yearly basis now is the Zenith Prep Kickoff Classic, which I look forward to working once again next week. August. And to find out more about all of the events that the Detroit Sports Commission is bringing to our very region, that is specifically the Metro Detroit area, please follow the Detroit Sports Commission on Twitter and on Instagram at DET Sports. And make sure to check out the Sports Commission's terrific website at DetroitSports.org. All right, Vito, before we talk about some names that interest you in terms of fulfilling the role that uh, Jose Iglesias left behind when he was not offered a contract and effectively gone from the Detroit Tigers, Tony Paul, every single year, has his list of top Major League Baseball free agents. Who do you think is number one on that list? Well, I would say, yeah, he does do that, like a top 50, right? Did he do a top 50 then again? I would say number one is Bryce Harper, but I'm guessing it's not because you asked me it. Is it Patrick Corbin? Nope. Manny Machado. Okay, well, he would have been my next guest, which I find a little bit surprising because he's Mr. No Hustle. He's not Mr. Hustle whatsoever, and he's exclaimed it himself. He's told people, and now he's trying to cover up for it and kind of trace back those comments that he made that he said he didn't really well, worry about being Mr. Hustle, and that's not really part of his style. Tony thinks he lands with the Yankees on an eight-year, $242 million deal. Yeah, he'll get paid handsomely. So will Harper, so will Patrick Corbin. Those guys are still out there in the open market, and I expect all three of them to get long-term deals, too, to get deals north of five years. I would say six years plus for all those guys. Yep. Number two, he has Bryce Harper, and he believes that Bryce Harper will land with the Phillies on a nine-year deal around $300 million. Well, Phillies are looking to spend money big time this offseason. They want to, well, move up the ranks and contend, I think, for a World Series next season. So, Guess what? Well, you, you get Bryce Harper, maybe you get Manny Machado too, or at least one of the two, and you upgrade extremely your ball club, and then you start competing for a World Series as soon as 2019. And the Phillies are on the up and up, and I expect them to be a contender at least, at the very least, in the National League East Division in 2019. Decent at arms. A lot of good starters. Dallas Keiko, starting pitcher, 31 years old, um, looking probably to stay with Houston. Uh, Tony thinks that uh, Dallas Keiko will stay with Houston around a five-year deal, $100 million, staying with the Houston Astros. Okay. You and know. that'd be big money for the Astros to spend after you know spending the money. Well, having the contract of Justin Verlander still on the books for this following season. But guess what? Keiko's younger than Verlander, and Verlander might be, well, jumping ship after 2019. So you might lose out on him. And because of that, you might want to extend a guy like Dallas Keiko, who you can kind of build around for the long-term future more than Justin Verlander at this point. And it makes me think of, after discussing all these names out there right now in the open market, that the Seattle Mariners are looking to deal potentially Robinson Cano and have discussed things, I think preliminary talks, with the Yankees and Mets to gauge their interest in Cano. Robbie, don't you know Cano? I mean, could he be a guy that lands back in the Bronx? As of right now, I guess it's at least a slight possibility. Now, a pitcher, a reliever that was dominant from 2014 to 2017, struggled in 2018 largely due to injuries, was Andrew Miller. 34 years old, uh, injury plague season last year, probably going to command somewhere around three years, $29 million, around $10 million a year. Tigers, not known for having the best bullpen. Could you take a $10 million a year flyer on a guy and bring him back to Detroit, Andrew Miller, knowing that if he's healthy, he was pretty dominant. I mean, the Indians used him in several situations when they had their run. How much money are you saying? About $10 million a year. No, I wouldn't spend $10 million if I'm the Tigers. I don't think anybody should spend $10 million on him after what happened in 2018 because he wasn't that great of a reliever. He's not that lights out, late inning, you know, high leverage situation reliever at this point after what he did in 2018 at least. Now, he could recover, but I'm not going to pay him $10 million to come to the Tigers, definitely. Okay. Now, Jose Iglesias, no longer part of the Detroit Tigers. Nice void to fill. I kind of think that they're not going to go in free agency and bring somebody up. I think they're just going to have you know somebody from within take over that starting shortstop position. 
You know, you've talked about it with Max and talked about it with others. Recap for those that did not get a chance because it was a holiday and things like that. What you talked about with Max and where we stand currently in terms of what the Tigers could do at that shortstop position and what you think is best for the Tigers at that spot because it's a key defensive spot. And although Jose Iglesias couldn't handle it offensively, you know, at times he made it look easy out there when he was flashing the glove and and making some plays. You mean people didn't listen to Max and I talk last week before the holiday? Man, what a shame. Anyways, John Paul Morosi did tweet out that sources say Detroit has yet to narrow its list, but the list includes for shortstop targets. Alcides Escobar, who played second base short, he can play second base and shortstop, played with the Royals. He's a all-glove, no-bat guy. Freddie Galvis, Jordy Mercer, and a Danny Hechevarria, who we've discussed now in past episodes of Tiger Stuck. Remember, we had that discussion before with Brennan Kudla, my buddy who was on a couple of weeks ago before the holiday, too. Max Boltman, though, did bring up an interesting name to consider. And DJ LeMahieu, who went to Birmingham Brother Rice, has starred with the Rockies, has won multiple gold gloves at second base. So a second baseman, though, would it technically fill the Tigers' void at shortstop, but you could shift somebody over from second base. Maybe even LeMahieu becomes a shortstop if you sign him. But he's going to want some money that I think the Tigers, once again, aren't willing to spend because they're just going to be cheap this offseason because they don't expect to win in 2019. Now, Tony Paul has similar ideas as I do, because you're kind of looking at somebody that's going to be around seven, seven and a half million dollars, maybe just paying him a little bit more. But he kind of also looks at a name that I kind of thought of as well in doing some research. He thinks the number 34 ranked free agent, Freddie Galvis, former shortstop over there at San Diego Padres, 29 years old. And uh, here's the report that Tony Paul gives a uh, great writer at the Detroit News. He's not going to wow you at the plate, though he has some pop. His defense is superb and he's reliable playing 162 games each of the last two years. He predicts the Tigers signed Freddie Galvis. Two years, total contract, $15 million. Yeah, so $7.5 million. I think that's about what the Tigers will spend on a shortstop if they do add one this offseason because they don't want to spend a lot of bucks. And guess what? DJ LeMayhew is going to demand more than $7.5 million. He's going to get $10 million. At least maybe eleven and a half or twelve mil on a two year deal, so or three year deal. And the Tigers aren't willing to spend that money right now because they're not trying to win. They're not in that win now mode. They want to build for the future and for twenty twenty or twenty twenty one and beyond. So signing a guy like DJ Mayhew could prevent somebody else from coming up and being a big time contributor come twenty twenty, come twenty twenty one. I think more specifically, come twenty twenty one and beyond. And LeMahieu, I don't think, wants to just come here because he is from here and played at Birmingham Brother Rice. I don't think he's going to take a hometown discount to play with the Tigers when they're rebuilding. So I don't see LeMahieu coming here. So Freddie Galvis, you might have to settle on Freddie Galvis. And if you can get him for under eight mil a year over two years, I would say go ahead and sign Freddie Galvis said. Or a Danny Hechevarria. Or a Jordy Mercer for that cost. But I would think Galvis is better than Mercer. And Hechevarria is close to him. And like I mentioned, Alcides Escobar. I don't want to touch Alcides Escobar. I think Alcides Escobar could be the cheapest to come by, but I think he's the low man on the totem pole when you consider him, Galvis, Mercer, and Hechevarria. Now, if you didn't get a chance, definitely check out the podcast that we did um, where we had the Vito Awards, a great podcast episode, and some of the names obviously won awards too. So you did a good job. I wanted to give you credit, take time out, and give you some praise because some of the names that you handed out the Vito Award to, uh, they actually did come out and win the Cy Young and things like that. A couple awards that you can give out, Rookie of the Year in the American League and National League and also Manager of the Year in the American League and National League. So we got to rack up those awards because I think a lot of people liked it and uh, we tagged a lot of people and the photos came out great. So I liked how the Vito Awards uh, came out. So definitely check that out. And you can check out every podcast that we have archived on our YouTube platform and definitely on demand at DetroitSportsPodcast.com. I would say American League Manager of the Year. I'll just answer now that, those awards. AL Manager of the Year, it went to Bob Melvin. Could have gone to Kevin Cash of the Rays. Kevin Cash or Bob Melvin. Now, American League Rookie of the Year, Glaber Torres of the Yankees. Or you could say Shohei Otani, who won the Rookie of the Year award in the American League, and I think deservedly so because he played both ways. Who does that? First guy since Babe Ruth, and it'd be good at both as a starting arm and then as a hitter, as a DH. I mean, he's slammed the ball at times, could hit for power, showcase that at a premium rate, really, throughout the season, too. His whole entire rookie campaign with the LA Angels of Anaheim, and also with the Halos this season, he displayed the pitching prowess, the ability to be an effective every day starting, or, you know, every fifth day starting arm. So he went out there, took care of business, 
both as a pitcher and as a power hitting uh, DH as a rookie this season with the Halos. So I think Otani was very deserving of that American League Rookie of the Year award, which he won for the 2018 campaign. And uh, stay tuned as we continue to record weekly episodes of Tigers Talk. A lot of big names might be on the move. Robinson Cano, rumored back, yes. rumored to be going back to the Yankees. Uh, Baumgartner, obviously everybody remembers him uh, six years ago when he dominated the Tigers and when he was able to you know, handle his business. Remember that run that the Giants had where every other year they were in the postseason? 2010, doing... 2012, and 2014 they won. They beat the Tigers in 2012 in a sweeping fashion. And then remember Horrible tw- to see. Remember 2014 where he just came back on short rest and had just this amazing pitching performance. Mm-hmm. He might be on the on the block too. So interesting stuff in terms of who could sign. Um, and that's just how it's shaking out right now in Major League Baseball. Movers and shakers. Now, I do want to ask, if there's a name, you know, obviously Bryce Harper, Manny Machado, uh, Dallas Keuchel, if the Tigers could bust open their checkbook and sign one guy to a big deal to compliment Miguel Cabrera and Jordan Zimmerman, is there anybody that you'd love to see here wearing uh, the old English tee? I guess I would say Bryce Harper. I mean, it's too easy to say that, but I would have to dig deeper really to give you another name. But Bryce Harper comes to mind right away because he's, See, well, he's Vito, the biggest fish in the pond. See, Vito, you're just one of those guys that's just he, all about the sexy. All he the would sexy. help no. out the outfield, too. Wrong. And they need some outfield help. That's why I would say him. Kimbrell is available from Boston, and most likely he's going to stay there. But you know what? That's a guy that can go out there and handle his business. I like the I like his uh, unusual stance when he's ready to pitch. But he was lights out in that World Series, and that's a guy that could solidify the back end. And uh, it's just... And and that's what I wanted to leave you with to end the podcast was going through 2018, I thought was going to be rough. It wasn't as bad. I mean, 162 games is long, but once the Tigers started losing, it made it easier because the games didn't mean a whole heck of a lot. You could just kind of watch and see a little bit. Um, Going forward, it does kind of seem like 2018, 2019, and maybe even 2020 are kind of throwaway years. And then once they kind of establish a core and decide what their payroll is going to be, you know, stable at, then we can start to really crunch down and bring in some talent. But it was okay. It was not bad recording podcasts, talking about the league, talking about the Tigers. And at least early on, they were competitive, and we could at least entertain the notion laughably, like you would say, that they could have you know made a run, especially since the Central wasn't that great. But they did tail off, and uh, you did get a chance to see what Ron Gardenhire was able to do that first year. More of the same you know, coming in year two. It's going to be a struggle. But I do think under Ron Gardenhire, they're going to play pretty hard and they're going to be competitive just, again, in that neighborhood of 68 to 75 wins. Maybe 98 losses again, maybe for a third straight year, 64 or 98. Could very well happen. I I doubt it. Maybe 95 at the least amount. I I think you can expect 95 for the least amount of losses by the Tigers in 2019. What was your experience? Well, I think they teased you a little bit at the beginning of the season, but I never believed in them tremendously when they were teasing us. I said, I'm not going to put up with this tease. I've put up with enough teases in my life. Maybe of the opposite sex, I'm saying, too, kind of. Anyways, these Tigers teased us. They're not going to be anything of relevance, high degree of relevance in 2019 either. Expect 95 or more losses. I would say 95 losses, once again, is the floor for the Tigers in 2019. So I could see another 64 and 98 campaign. They're not going to excite you, and they're going to go through growing pains on the field once again. Uh, you're going to see Jacoby Jones struggle again. I mean, he's a starting center fielder. Kristen Stewart is going to be, what, the left fielder who can't play left field? Castellanos can't play right field? They're both DH types. Cabrera's going to be shifting to DH more and more. And I think Casty should be spelling him at first base. I would love to see that happen. I don't think it will, though. But, man, I would love to see that happen because I don't think Cabrera can last at first base even full-time anymore. And you're going to see some other young guys come up, maybe Daz Cameron next season, and maybe start to emerge or at least get some reps in the outfield and start to hit a little bit and showcase what he is made of. And hopefully these guys get better and take steps forward like Jamer Candelario. I hope he becomes better at fielding the hot corner at hitting as well consistently and specifically getting on base and hitting for power. Castellanos, why can't he take maybe one more step defensively at least and maybe offensively? And maybe he's gone. Maybe he's dealt this offseason. So a lot of variables that are moving and at this point a lot of guys that still uh, could be dealt because a lot of teams, I would imagine Doc, as the winter meetings do commence in December, I would expect that a lot of teams will be willing and dealing. And maybe the Tigers even make a move that comes out of left field. No pun intended. Great podcast. Always enjoy talking baseball with you. You can follow Vito Valeni Churko on Twitter at Vito Jerome. 
follow the network at Detroit Podcast. We'll be talking baseball. We haven't forgot about the Detroit Tigers. Unfortunately, a lot of the Detroit teams aren't poised to be um, really contenders in any area, not even maybe even to make the postseason, but we'll be here talking about it. The rebuild will be here all along the way. Thanks to the sponsors again, the Detroit Sports Commission and the Legacy Football Organization. They make our broadcast possible, and they're great sponsors of the DSP Network. Great talking to you, Vito. Look forward to it next week. Again, welcome to Motown, Matty Moe. Adios.